Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study held at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church in Jackson, Michigan. I will be your host, Todd Gale, as we walk our way through the book of Genesis, a line-by-line study of the first book of the Sacred Scriptures. Hello friends, peace and grace be with you. We are in Genesis chapter 14. We just saw the priest King Melchizedek who showed up. He's the first priest mentioned in the Bible. He offers a sacrifice, a, a sacred meal of bread and wine. He blesses Abe and Abe gives a tithe to Mel. And the Eucharistic prayer um, in Mass, the first Eucharistic prayer, specifically honors the bread and wine offered by your priest Melchizedek, right? So um, we talked about him at great length last time. He is the priest of El Elyon, meaning the God Most High. And bread and wine later on is going to be a thanksgiving offering in Israel, a non-bloody grain offering and thanksgiving offering called the Todah. Jews have always taught that when the Messiah comes, the animal sacrifices will end, and the only sacrifice remaining throughout the rest of time will be the Todah. Huh. Isn't that interesting? The messianic priesthood, the priesthood of the Messiah, starts with bread and wine and ends with bread and wine. This character, Melchizedek, is pretty awesome. We're going to pick up in verse 21. Um, the king of Sodom is there, and he says to Abram, Give me the persons, you take the goods. And Abram says, I'm not going to take anything that's yours. Right? Uh, otherwise, you're going to say, I'm the one that made Abram rich. It seemed the king of Sodom was there with, with Melchizedek and Abe all throughout this divine supper. The king wanted a fair share of the plunder. He wanted all of the people, the warriors, the servants. The, but, but he offered Abram the stuff. And Abram swears. He, he literally says, I have sworn. He, he has literally raised his hand to the Lord. And he indicates, and that indicates that Abram made a vow. And he was not going into the battle to get more riches. He was going into the battle to be a kinsman redeemer. We talked about that last time. He, he went to save his nephew. And Abe knew that the booty from the Cheddar Four, Cheddar Laomer and, and the rest of those kings, he knew that the booty from them and, and the king of Sodom, none of that stuff is going to make Abram rich because God makes Abram rich. Now, I hope you catch something really important. In, in verse 22, Abe calls God, Lord God, Most High. So if you've been following our names for God, right? Some, some of the critics and the scholars who just love to tear down Judaism and Christianity, they try to rewrite history. They try to say that El Elyon is just a local pagan god of the Canaanites, and they just poo-poo the whole idea that Melchizedek is any you know really important character. This title that that Abram says just blows that theory out of the water. Abe links the covenant name Yahweh. Remember when whenever we see the Lord, it's Yahweh. He links the covenant name Yahweh with El Elyon, and he says the Lord. God Almighty, right? The the Yahweh El Elyon, maker of heaven and earth. Isn't that just so cool? So clearly, Melchizedek and Abram are talking about the same God of Israel. And it was the same God that we saw in Genesis 1 and 2 and, and onward. So now we flip the page to chapter 15. 
the word of the Lord comes to Abram in a vision, and he says, don't be afraid, I'm your shield. This is the very first time that phrase shows up in the Bible, the word of the Lord. Man, this is rich. John's gospel says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In Judaism and in Christianity, the word is not just something that God says. The word is not just naming something or saying a few words of prophecy. The word of the Lord is the meaning, the cause, the power, the grace, the very presence of Yahweh himself. And as Christians, we know that the word of the Lord is the sacred scripture, the Bible. And also the word of the Lord is is Jesus, the very presence of Yahweh himself. Wow, this is just so cool. We can go on for a long time, but we won't. How does the word of the Lord appear to people in the Bible? Sometimes it's a personal appearance. We're going to see that. Sometimes an audible voice. Many times dreams or visions. Sometimes through angels. Sometimes the Spirit of God just kind of enters the mind. Sometimes it goes to the heart of the person. Sometimes it's through a prophet or a preacher. There's at least one time it was the birth of a baby in Bethlehem. Right? That's how the, the word of the Lord comes to people. Well, here the word of the Lord comes to Abram in a vision. And the last time that I checked that word, it meant that the Lord God was somehow seen. Right? It was a vision. And so the Lord says, do not be afraid. We've, we've talked about this before. That supposedly is in the Bible once for every single day of the year. 365 times that line or something similar shows up in the Bible. I went on a hunt once to, to hunt this down and to count it. I got a little over 300 and I, I couldn't find 365, but I'll take everybody's uh word on that, I guess. Abel has, um, or I, I mean, Abe, Abraham, Abram, right? He has reason to be afraid. The Lord says, don't be afraid. He has reason to be afraid. The remains of the Cheddar Four will probably be teaming up to get revenge and come back and hunt him down. Human beings live for revenge. And this is an ancient savage society. You can bet that Abe's people will not be left alone. So the Lord is saying, look, I, I'm your shield. I'm your protector. I protected you in the war against the Cheddar Four, and you trusted me. Let me protect you now. Let me be your shield now. Trust me. It's almost like in chapter 14, Abe paced, passed some kind of test. He, he passed a test with that battle. He trusted the Lord with supernatural faith. And he's stronger now. And the Lord wants him to trust him even more. Now remember, in, verse, in, in chapter 12, God already told Abe that he was going to give him a land, a name, and a worldwide blessing. Those promises were already made. Well, now we're going to see in the next few chapters, the Lord is going to ratify each one of these promises by making a three-part covenant. He's going to double down on each one of these, a land, a name, and a worldwide blessing. Abram seems to speak really freely with God in, in these verses up through chapter, uh, up through verse 5 in, uh, in chapter 15. He's talking with the Lord, and, and, and he's just communicating with him, and he calls him, O Yahweh Elohim, O Lord God. And, and he just opens up his heart to the Lord, and he just really talks to him. And he says, Lord, look, you gave me no offspring other than a slave boy who was born in my house. Is he to be my heir? Is that what you mean? I mean, this guy, Eliza of Damascus, he was Abram's chief assistant, his main servant, his associate. Sounds like he was a really good man, but he's not a son to Abram. The promise of a bazillion descendants is so clear and so certain, Abe probably thought it was going to happen immediately, and it still hasn't happened. 
And in fact, from this point, it's still like 15 years away. So his descendants are, are going to be like, like the number of the stars. One of those descendants, in fact, is going to be the greatest descendant. It's going to be the bright morning star. Jesus mentioned in Revelation chapter 22. So Abram believed in the Lord and, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. This is really important. There's a great note in the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible on page 37, Believe the Lord. If you get a chance, look at that. So the Lord counts it to Abram as righteousness. Righteousness is basically holiness. It's being right with God. Theologically, we might call it sanctifying grace. It's the gift of being saved. Remember Noah? He was a righteous man. He walked with God. But the Christian understanding of being saved is that none of us are good enough to accomplish righteousness, to accomplish holiness on our own. We have to have the righteousness of God living in us. How does that happen? By doing just what Abram is doing. He believes in the Lord and then he participates in the Lord's plan. He steps out in faith and cooperates. This is the first time in scripture it says that someone believed in the Lord. It's said before that people have called on the Lord. But Abram does more than just call on him. He believes, he trusts. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, says Paul in Romans, in chapter 4 of Romans in the New Testament. In the time of Jesus and before Jesus, the Jewish people believed that the ritual laws of the Old Covenant, all those old rules from Moses, that was the only way a person could become holy. It was the only way to be right with God. And St. Paul will point out later in Romans to notice that Abram is called righteousness here in Genesis before he ever enters the covenant with circumcision, before he ever enters the covenant with the Lord in a specific way. He is righteous way before the law of Moses is ever given. In James, in the New Testament, he points out in, in the second chapter of James that the faith that, that made Abram righteous wasn't so much just believing in God, you know, like, like just believing God exists, just believing God is real. That's not really faith, right? We usually speak of, of believing in God, like it's a decision of the mind. It's an ascent of thought. But this is believing God in a way that Believing God loves us. Believing God is going to protect us, that he has a plan for us, that he calls us to follow him. Abram does not just believe in a God, that God is real. He has a living relationship with the Lord of the universe. He knows the Lord. St. James will say later in the New Testament, even the demons believe God is real. Even Satan knows verses of the Bible, but do they follow him? Do they step out in active faith? Do they love the Lord? Do they enter into a relationship with him? Is our belief way beyond just the belief that there is a God out there somewhere? Or is our belief in a personal God who knows us by name and calls each and every one of us? The promise that the Lord is making to Abe has already been made back in chapter 12. And Abram has demonstrated his faith by moving to Canaan, right? As Christians, we might even say, Abe has picked up his cross every day to follow the Lord. So this is the way faith works, right? This is what it is. Initially, faith is a gift. It's a supernatural virtue. It's one of the three theological virtues of God. Everybody that's a believer, everyone that, that takes the name of the Lord, everyone that's baptized, we get the supernatural gift of faith. But it's just a little. It's just a small amount of faith. And the faith 
then is also our response. So first it's a gift, then we respond. And when we respond with faith, God gives us a little more faith, and we respond a little more, and he gives us a little more, and pretty soon that gift of faith builds into a gift of righteousness. It's all God's righteousness. It's the total full righteousness, the total full faith that Jesus Christ himself has that he gives to us. Like, this just blows your mind. This is really, really amazing. Now, Abram is going to boldly ask God for proof of the promise. He wants proof that, that, that um, this promise is going to be made to him. So the Lord tells him to bring uh, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a ram, a turtle dove, a pigeon. We're going to cut him down the middle. We're going to cut him in half. There's going to be blood. And uh, this is really strange. This is really weird. So, okay, I'll just drive over to the local Walmart and pick out a few choice animals and chop them up. What is going on here? Maybe those animals are still hanging out by the ark. Maybe if Abram can find the ark, he can find a bunch of animals there. What is going on here? There's a, there's a couple layers of things happening here that is really crucial. This is very important to the biblical story. Remember, this culture is very different from 21st century America. This is the ancient form of signing a mortgage. You want the land that I just promised you? Let's sign that contract with blood. Okay, we're going to chop up some animals. We're going to spill some blood. And it's not just a contract, actually. What we're doing is we're making a covenant, an unbreakable promise. And it's not just an exchange of land and money. This is an exchange of lives. Back in these days with Abram, contracts and covenants were made by the sacrificial cutting of animals. The split carcasses are lying on the ground. And the covenant is made when both parties of this agreement walk between the halves of the animals that are all chopped up on the side, right? History shows us this was definitely a part of the Chaldean culture and a, and a big part of many of the Mesopotamian cultures. So there's a line, like probably, I don't know, 15 to 20 feet of carcasses on each side, it's like Moses going through the Dead Sea, right? Going through the sea. There's water on the right, water on the left. Here there's blood on the right and blood on the left. The Lord is literally cutting a covenant. The Jews call it a covenant between the pieces, right? Cutting a covenant. Even today we say we cut a deal, right? We think this is where that comes from. So what's the point of walking between dead animal bodies? Like, what is that about? Well, the point is, it's for the two parties walking between the blood and saying, if I break this covenant, let this same bloodshed be poured out on me. It's actually calling down a covenant curse. If I break the promise, May I be sliced up and, and murdered like these animals. Isn't that so strange? So I want you to notice something. God initiates this. This is not Abram making a deal with God. Hey, Yahweh, you give me the land. I'll worship you. I'll cut up some animals. This is totally God's idea. And notice here, Abe goes into, as, as you read on, he goes into some kind of a trance. Like he, he falls asleep. Only God is actually the one that, that passes between the blood. And he does it as fire and smoke. Now, now in human covenants, both parties always walked between the blood. But here, only God does. Because only God can really keep his part of a covenant perfectly. And ultimately, when there's the breaking of a covenant on our part, 
and humans almost always break their end of the covenant, we should be cut up like the animals. We should bleed. We should die. We should be sacrificed. That should happen to every single one of us who breaks a promise with God. But instead, God pays the price of the broken covenant through his son, Jesus. God himself, God the Son, takes on the covenant curse. Now, I cannot underline how important this is. So, so why a heifer and a goat and a ram and turtle dove and pigeon? Why three years old? Well, these animals are the ones that are later going to be commonly sacrificed to the Lord and the law of Moses. Later, we're going to see these same animals show up quite often for sacrifices. The fact that the Lord tells Abram to bring all five at once instead of just one cow or one goat, it points to the fact that something really important is about to take place. This is a pointing forward to all the future sacrifices. It's sort of like this sacrifice, this covenant is such a big deal. It's worth all the future sacrifices put together. It foreshadows and points forward to all the animal sacrifices yet to come. Now, most other sacrifices in the Old Testament at the time of Moses and after, it's, it's usually a one-year-old goat or a one-year-old sheep. But a three-year-old would be just entering the prime of adult life. Like, these are the strongest animals. And these three larger sacrifices, each one is three years old. It kind of hints of the Trinity. Three, kind of hints of three days in the tomb. Three, not sure exactly how it all ties together, but it's all in that imagery of sacrifice of the Trinitarian God, of the sacrifice of Jesus. And the birds are uncut. They're, they're not chopped up. It might be hinting at the Holy Spirit. It might be hinting at the resurrection. There are lots of different thoughts um, I looked up all kinds of things. Again, no two theologians seem to agree exactly what's going on. So these animals are representing like life, their strength, and, 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 and they're strong, and there's bloodshed. Why bloodshed? Why does there have to be bloodshed? Remember, there's life in the blood. The sacrifice animals shows us there's, there's really two things, two really big things we want, we want to look at. The sacrificed animals show us, first of all, the bloody, awful, ugly, disordered reality of sin. When we disobey the order of God, literally, when we disobey the God of life, literally things are like turned inside out, like life is gutted. Life is spilled out. Peace and order and harmony is chopped up. Like death is just wrong. It's unnatural. It's loud and it's desperate and it's ugly and it's gross because that's what sin is. Sin is to say no to the right, to the natural, to the peaceful, to the calm, to the beautiful God, and to the life he wants to give us. So this is a way for us humans to see when we slaughter an animal and sacrifice, and ultimately when Jesus is sacrificed, this is what sin does to the heart of God. A very visual, visceral display. And the second thing is that these animals, they're substitutes. On one hand, it should be us who dies like this. Why? Because we sin. We choose to walk away from life and order. So the animals die in our place. Now, on, on the, the other hand, we know that Jesus, God himself, is going to step in and he will die for us. 
He's the ultimate sacrifice. He's the ultimate substitute. But his death is once forever. And these animal sacrifices, they're like a substitute for the real sacrifice. They're a substitute for the real Lamb of God. They die in his place until he actually is sacrificed. Once Jesus is sacrificed, we don't need any more sacrifices. I've heard it said that the animal sacrifices are sort of like placeholders. They temporarily, you know, fill in. They're the practice ones before the perfect one. Now, I know this leads to lots of questions. This is very mysterious. Um, it kind of boggles the mind. There's a lot of mystery here, and, and, and there's a lot of shadows of God's truth in all, in all this. But the whole idea of sacrifice is to give us a visual outer form to see what is really truly happening in the spiritual world. It's sort of like, I don't know, an outward sign of an inward spiritual movement. In verse 11, birds of prey come down on the carcasses and Abe drives them away. I'm not really sure if this is super significant or if it just means birds of prey came down on the carcasses. It kind of looks like an omen, like the enemy, like Satan is getting involved. Vultures and ravens coming down. It's kind of like Satan interfering. And then after this, Abe has this dread and this darkness that comes upon him. Not really sure what that's about. I haven't really found anything that satisfies me with this. But in verse 12 through 16, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And, um, and uh, the Lord says to him, No, certainly your descendants will be strangers in the land, and they're going to be held and afflicted for 400 years. There's a lot going on in verses 12 through 16. Now, when the sun was going down, Abram must be kind of related to me because it starts getting dark. Sorry, I'm going to bed. I'm falling asleep. It's, it's night out. Now, this is not a normal sleep. This is the deep sleep, the same kind of deep sleep that fell upon Adam when Eve was created from his side. The Greek word, if you were to read this in Greek, is ecstasis, an ecstasy, some sort of dreamlike supernatural sleep. And it appears very dark and scary because Abe sees a vision of the suffering of his people for 400 years. God is showing Abram a peek ahead and when the people of Israel were, will endure slavery in Egypt for 400 years, and that's just before the time when Moses brings the people out of Egypt, right? This is a very complicated blessing. This isn't all happy and fun and games. Now, when the sun was going down, no, wait a second. Did you see that? When the sun was going down, in the, in the flow of events, six verses earlier, God showed Abram the stars of the sky and he said, count them. Yet here in verse 12, the sun is going down? Like has a whole day gone past? The first time I ever really questioned this, it, it was mind-blowing to me. Jeff Cavins, in his uh, Bible timeline, um, just wonderful, wonderful resource through Ascension Press. It's the, the material that Father Mike Schmitz used for the Bible in the year. The first time I ever heard of this, it looks like the sun sets in verse 12, but way up in verse 5, God tells Abe, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able. Those will be your descendants. Wow, so it sounds like maybe God tells Abram to count the stars in broad daylight. Abe's family is there, but it's hidden by a veil. It's unseen. 
almost impossible to believe. Just like in the daytime, the stars are all there, but they're hidden by a veil. They're unseen. It's almost impossible to believe. Count the stars if you can. Are there stars there? Well, yeah, of course they're there. You just can't see them now. In the same way, Abe, your descendants are really there. Yes, you just can't see them now. Right? So when he says, count the stars if you can, it's not like Abe's an idiot and he doesn't know how to count. And it's not there's so many that he can't count them. I think it makes the most sense. This is even more impactful. Count the stars if you can, because the Lord takes him to look at the sky in daylight. And then about six verses later, the sun sets. Isn't that cool? Now in verse 16, um, God promises Abe that his people will come back in the fourth generation when the iniquities of the Amorites is complete. That's verse 16. What What is that about? I mean, we could just skip this. It's just kind of a throwaway line, right? But no, it's actually kind of important. It seems to be saying that the Amorites, these are the first people Joshua is going to defeat when they come out of Egypt after the Passover, when they start to conquer the Holy Land several centuries later. The Amorites are the first per people that Israel conquers when they're overtaking the Holy Land. The Amorites have to become filled with iniquity. They have to become twisted and wicked. And when their wickedness is complete, like maybe when they deserve to be conquered, that's when God will bring Israel back into the land. The Lord is saying, this is going to happen in my timing. We may not understand this. My ways are not your ways, and your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. Now in verse 17 to 21, the covenant is made. And when it came to pass, the sun went down, it was dark, and there's a, a smoking fire pot and a burning, a burning torch that passes between the pieces, while Abram is in a trance, in an ecstasy, right? And walking through the sacrificed animals in the covenant ceremony, God is representing both sides of the covenant. He represents himself twice. A pot of smoke and a burning torch. Like in the Exodus, a pillar of cloud and, and, the, and, and the fire, the light that leads Israel through the, the wilderness. On Mount Sinai, when Moses goes up to meet God, there's smoke on the mountain. God's um, Shekinah glory, right, is, is this glory cloud. There's a light, burning, fiery cloud that comes and rests upon the tabernacle. The burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Fire from heaven comes and it consumes the sacrifices um, for, during the, the, the time of Elijah. Right? God is showing that this is a unilateral covenant. It's one-sided. It's all God. Abram never signed the covenant because he passively watched while God signed it for both parties. Therefore, the certainty of the covenant that God made with Abram is based on who God is, not on Abram or what Abram would do. This covenant could not fail and will not fail because God will not fail. In a sense, Abram signs the covenant with faith, but God signs it with the blood of his son, who is represented right now by these animals. Later, for us, God the Father is going to walk through the broken and bloody body of Jesus to establish his covenant with us. God's going to sign it for both of us. Like Abram, we enter the covenant by faith. 
God does all the work. So chapter 15 really is essential for us to understand in order to make sense of the rest of the Bible, to make sense of Judaism, to make sense of Jesus. So, so to be really clear, I want to make sure we get this. Death and bloodshed is the result of sin. It's the result of walking away from the God of life. And what's supposed to be ordered and beautiful is cut up and turned inside out and is bloody and awful. Those of us who sin, we should be the ones. We should be the ones that are sacrificed. Because we ask for it every time we sin. We are purposefully walking away from God, but God gives us a chance to repent by having his son take the death that's meant for us. In the animals of the old covenant, they pave the way for Jesus. They take his place until he actually sacrifices himself. All of this, why? Why? So we can live with God forever, a life in heaven, as we were created to do. He messed up, he paid the price, right? We earned a price that we could never pay. And he paid a price that he didn't earn. Right? It's, not, it's not his price but he pays it with his life. He doesn't pay it with money, doesn't play, pay it with stuff. He pays it with life blood. This scene is all about the setup for the rest of the sacrificial system, for all the rest of the Bible and for Jesus. The scene is so, so important. And it's, it's so imperative that we get this. Read through this again, wrestle with this. Um, you know, just just really wrestle with these ideas and these concepts. It's it's bizarre. It's dark. It's um, mysterious, and it's so essential. And I don't know how um, any of our our Jewish brothers and sisters, God God love you. I don't know how they make sense of this without seeing the Messiah in the end, without seeing Jesus making all of this fit together. I truly don't understand how any of this would make sense without Jesus. Next time we'll pick up in chapter 16 and the soap opera continues. This gets very exciting. All right, see you next time. Thanks everybody. God bless. Enjoy your week. Have a great blessed week. Blessings. Blessings. Thank you so much for walking with us through this study of the book of Genesis.